This is Chain of Thoughts, an original podcast by Aaron Coder that covers the latest trends in product and AI. In Chain of Thoughts, every show is an element of a chain, connecting product with AI and AI with product. From understanding a brand new machine learning technology to covering the newest experiences around product and design, Chain of Thoughts keeps the chain growing with the thing that we value the most, our thoughts. Chain of Thoughts is an original production by Aaron Coder, a product design and development company based in Boston, Massachusetts, that delivers specialized services around engineering, product, and AI. Welcome to today's episode of Chain of Thoughts. Um, we are happy to be again here with you, with all of you guys. Um, here we are, Nacho. Uh, I'm the, the director of the AI Labs at Iron Coder, and we have Vico. Vico, can you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Vico. I'm head of product here at Iron Coder. Thank you if you listened and... to the last episode. Yes. And Go on, we're screening this episode. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. I'm Kylie. I'm product manager at Iron Coder and have a background in UX and design. If you want to know more about us, you can listen to our previous episode where we introduced yeah. ourselves properly. But um, today's idea is to, well, first of all, be a little bit more relaxed than what than how we were in, a, in our previous episode, because we were like super serious and we were kind of frightened. But at the same time, it was a pilot, so it was okay to be like that. Uh, and as we said in the introduction, the idea today is to talk more about LLMs from a product perspective. So probably I will speak less than in the last episode where we focused on the technical details of LLMs. And we will listen to Vico and Calde and some of the insights from them uh, when it comes to innovating with LLMs and all these topics. Um, so I'd like to start with a question for you guys, which is about how LLMs, how LLMs found you when they started to become trendy. We, we know that ChatGPT has been around for like almost a year, but I think that the moment when we saw it for the first time was kind of different than the, or the landscape at that moment was different than the one that we, that we have now, right? So I'd like to, to know more about your first reactions and, and, and how did you feel when you saw that happen for the first time? Yeah, in my case, um, I think that initially it was like uh, seeing like a uh, uh, huge amount of enthusiasm over it and I get into that and I started to think around what ChatGPT meant for the for us, for our world, for people working close, close to us and, and everything, right? And it was like a, uh, everybody was playing with it. I, I remember that, that initial moment of, of everybody playing with it and trying to do things with it and trying to find quickly like the limits and, and also a lot of trying to understand how it worked and, and what it did and what it, uh, uh, what were also like the, the errors that it has. I remember this, like for example, I think it was one month uh, after it was released, but I remember this uh, this guy trying to create like, a, a, like putting chat GPT to like create a business starting from <laughs> hundred bucks. And I found that, that example, like uh, everybody was trying new things and thinking a little bit with it. It was quite funny that time. Um, Biko? I was trying to, you? I was actually trying to remember because it's like uh, a year now feels like a whole life, mm -hmm. uh, especially after the release of this uh, tool, particularly. And I, I agree a little bit, uh, I agree a little bit, not completely actually with Kelda said. It was like, okay, this is a new tool. Uh, I remember I popping into it and started talking, like talking, chatting with the chat mother. And I was like, the beginning I was still struggling. I felt like, okay, this is a little paradox. Just provide the answers. Uh, it was like a little bit skeptical about actually how I would be able like to incorporate it to use it more 
uh, fluidly. And then I started experimenting a little bit also considering what the different, there were a lot of Reddit, uh, a lot of people talking about how you can use it and how to improve the usage of it. I started finding uh, a few applications. I left completely the Google search basically as my first way of sourcing information and was like that immediate thought of, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, can we keep playing around it? I remember one of the experiments that um, at the end of last year was more excited about was when I was finally able to really through a conversation with it, um, get it to understand my tone of voice and then actually incorporate my usage of emojis for content. And then it was like, okay, this could actually be even more interesting and much more workload releasing that I was expecting. Uh, and it was really interesting to see also, as Alda mentioned, the incredible myriad of products based on it. And it starts floating and we're going a little bit out of control uh, also, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no, and we were like, I used also to this uh, AI experiments to be just experiments uh, not being adopted by, by people. And I think that ChatGPT brought that, right? It was like a massive adoption so quick, so fast. And so in day one, we were just playing with it. A week after, we were like uh, thinking, okay, now this will write all of our emails, right? And maybe like a, a month after or two, it, it was like a, this is writing everything that we know in the internet and how it works. And, and, and a huge wave of enthusiasm started in that moment. Yeah. What about you, Nacho? Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah. I, I was going to, to, to mention that both your experiences are quite similar to the one that I had myself. Um, so at the very beginning, I remember that I had to write an article about ChatGPT for our blog in our encoder. Uh, so it was right after the release. And I said to myself, all right, I will go through the paper or the technical report. It was not a paper. Uh, so I, I tried to focus on the technical details as I, as I always do when it comes to AI. And then I found out that I said to myself, all right, this is a good tool for chit chatting and for playing around and to ask questions, random questions about facts and that stuff. Uh, so I remember that, uh, well, I published that article and a few days after that, uh, I was lying in my bed and I was super sad because I was building my house and, and, and the construction place was robbed. And I was like asking myself, what can I do to, to make it safer? And then I said, well, maybe I can ask ChatGPT about that. And I started to ask questions and I was like, oh, wow. it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, it started to answer things that were kind of obvious, but at the same time that I didn't think about uh, at the very beginning. So I was like, oh, maybe there are some other use cases that I'm not seeing. And then I started to use it on a daily basis, I realized. I, I, I learned a lot of use cases by just trying to play around with it and trying to find those opportunities. And I guess that this is what, what is going on from a product perspective, right? Like products are developed around these ideas that are first tried with ChatGPT and then wrapped around the user interface and, and, and becoming a digital tool. Um, so, so I guess that what you mentioned, I, I don't recall who of you guys mentioned this, but this, this idea of AI being always something for nerds and experimental uh, died with ChatGPT and became something completely different. And I guess that this has changed the way in which products are, are developed, which brings another question that I would like to ask you guys, which is how the, the, the product management and design community faced that hype wave around LLMs and is facing it, how they are doing it. Do you have any, any comments about that? Yes. Um... Yes, in a way, what I see is that it also started with the same enthusiasm, but right now I'm just seeing like some kind of disregard of it as a tool, like uh, LLMs are being incorporated, but 
the way they are seeing it, it's like affecting uh, others' work instead of, uh, of, uh, of product management work, right? And I think, um, so I have been like reading, like, for example, in, in, in some communities around about how um, LLMs can be used for product discovery. And the conclusion is always that, oh, it just will like uh, do like the dumb things and will be like doing the, the smart things, right? That's like the, the current conclusion. And I saw that in, in others like uh, fields, uh, the same reaction, right? It's like a disregard of this as a tool that will be um, integrated into our daily lives uh, much deeper. And I think that's because uh, the technology is in its early stages, right? So we just are playing with it over ChatGPT, which is like an isolated place that you know, isn't aware of our um, of our field, right? And our particular tooling, right? But if there was like, uh, if we could integrate LLMs into the context that we have and the tools that we use, I think that we change uh, a lot the panorama, how we integrate it. Yes, um, I have a small comment about that. I think that you're true in the sense that um, people are not taking AI as serious as they should take it. At the same time, I, I personally believe that LLMs will affect the way in which we work they are actually affecting the way in which we work because now we have a conference call and 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 we crave for these tools that extract the transcripts because now we want to analyze the transcripts afterwards we don't want to take notes during the during the conference calls and that's is just a tiny example but at the same time i believe that it will change our jobs uh it will eliminate some jobs for sure uh some of these tedious automated jobs, let's say. But at the same time, I think that these tools will probably unleash a new way of creativity for us. Or at least I hope that, uh, that, that we will have more time to devote to all that creativity part that cannot be automated with an AI yet, with, with, at least with an autoregressive model. I love that you bring this because it's actually one of the things that I was a little bit amazed by how the community was approaching this discussion. And bear with me a little bit and go into back, um, um, background. Um, there's a concept that has been for a long while ago used and it was actually established by, I think it was the World Economic Forum. It was to talk about the 4.0 industry and industrial revolution, new wave. Uh, at that point, and this has, quite a few years now, I was still, I remember teaching um, economic history at this point and in, in the university. And it was really interesting to see, and I was actually talking with uh, my students at that point, I think it was 2018, I think, um, on this, there had already been, there's, establishment of the discussion on how the advancement of technology and the new waves of automation were going to be affected to different types of job. There was establishment already at that point of um, what is the future of work and what is the future of our lives with relations to work and how it would affect uh, these, let's call it trajectories in some way. And there was like a whole group of people talking about this. This is going to be the reawakening of the human arts, for example. There was an expectation that we'll go back to the enlightenment. And as the automation of our jobs will be um, solved, we will have more time to work in the more creative things. It was also a big worry about how this actually will create also a bigger gap. Um, but all this I'm saying, because I remember the, this was uh, 2018, the first wave of um, not massive, but huge layers off in Japan with the release of Watson as an accountant uh, agent at that time. And that was already happening. And this conversation was established in some spheres of work. And I was amazed by not seeing that 
as much discussed in the technology space. Because it's like, hey, this is not so new. And this is not such a different trend. It's part of an already established trend for a few years. So I was a little bit shocked on that. Um, and with regard to what you're saying, Colin, specifically in product management and design space, I do agree. I haven't seen so much, but I think I um, was discussing with you earlier. I started seeing a few works that are trying to actually explore the way specifically uh, these new trends could be involved, but still in a really much, let's call it, research environment yet. And that's maybe the most complicated thing. How do we get uh, the design, um, anthropology design, and people that are specifically in design process research to actually permeate to the practice and, and not only us being like, okay, who is, oh, shit, that's <laughs> my, <AI. laughs> that's my computer doing what they, it wants. So, um, I knew, but I, let's say. Yeah, um, I got distracted now by the fireworks, but um, what I was trying to say is effectively, there's research that it's been done mindfully of how it could affect both discovery and design of products on these new technologies. So I am I would like to, to say there's some people that might be looking at that, uh, that we may not know about. And if you're listening to this episode, do please reach us out. We'd love to hear and discuss about people are looking at these too. Um, Definitely. But yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. And, and, and you brought something that, that I was thinking about for a while, which is uh, creativity, right? Uh, creativity is just one of these use cases and areas of AI, and we use it regularly for writing emails or to proofread our articles or for things like that. And I remember that one of the first points that I raised against the massive usage of ChatGPT was this idea of having all of us a uniform language, a language that it, that always passed through ChatGPT before reaching the final destination. And that's kind of sad because I, I prefer to get, I don't know, uh, best wishes for my birthday that are customized for myself, not customized <laughs> by an algorithm. Um, but this is just one of the use cases. And, and I'd like to know a little bit more about these use cases in particular from a product perspective, because then we can connect the dots from the products with the solution, let's say. So I'd like to know what are the, the most common use cases that you guys are, are seeing right now from a product perspective? Yeah. Um... Uh, I think there's like a no-brainer that is like um, automating processes that are tedious and also where a human in the middle can be like a liability. Uh, that's the thing that makes more sense to to adopt LLMs too. Um, and I think there are, all fields have, have a little bit of that, right? And even like transcriptions, if you think about it, it's like a tedious world, right? And, and we are not uh, relying anymore in, or trying not to relay anymore for transcriptions from audio to text. Um, of course, you need an, a human in the middle, a human in the loop to, mm -hmm. to do a review of that. But that's one of the cases that is the, the, one of the most common cases. And also, I, I'm seeing it trying to be used to summarize and in that sense to present summaries and as insights, right? So as if the LLM is doing the thinking work, right? They like can present a summary. And there, there are tools that we are use every day, like Miro, which is like a board, a virtual board to organize um, thinking into stickies and collaborate over it. Uh, but it's basically like a virtual whiteboard. Uh, but the thing is that uh, the, the tool itself tries to incorporate it. Like uh, they propose this, they have this promise that it will help you like organize the stickies that you put there. And still the, the output is not that, that good. I, I think they, they have like a long way to, to go, right? To get there, to be something useful. 
but those are, those are cases in which I'm, I'm seeing like uh, uh, LLMs incorporated, uh, generating insights, and also um, processing information and long chunks of data. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, it's very interesting because uh, this idea of, of of using it for ideation, idea of using it for ideation, um, is 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 kind of the the way in which we work with other humans, right? We interact one another and we chat one another and 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 we ask questions and what are your insights about something and with these chatbots powered by by LLMs we are, we are able to do that i always raise the same awareness let's say which is be careful because these models are just stochastic pirates they just know some probability distributions of the probability distribution of our language so and and, and they know no so to say they don't know anything they are just mathematical models uh, but they kind of produce the words that are coherent with these uh, probability distribution. They are not being creative. But at the same time, if they are good enough for helping us to come up with new ideas, that's that's amazing. Um, Biko, yeah, what are your... your oh, sorry, sorry. At, at the level okay. that I'm... I mean, they are stochastic, stochastic parrots and they are helping us think, right? So... I have started wondering myself how <laughs> I am, how, how I am not a stochastic parrot because I'm feeling like, uh, yeah, like, uh, I mean, like I also like processed a lot of language and also like uh, um, helping others to have conversations and helping them think, right? Like a lot of discovery that we do in product is uh, we talk to others, we try to help them think and to organize their thinking. I, I will introduce just a small comment because you have triggered me, but uh, we can have uh, existential, it existential problems now <laughs> no, no, being triggered. It's more, it's more from a technical perspective because I think that when it comes to language, um, we have like different layers here. So mm. uh, with language, we have syntaxes and we also have the semantics of the language. And those are the two things that we are able right now to capture with LLMs. Uh, so that part of the equation is already solved. But the part that we are not ready to solve yet with artificial intelligence is the conceptualization of the world. These LLMs pretend to conceptualize the world but they are just able to produce words in a way that lets you mm. believe that. But they are unable to understand how touching a, a human being feels like, how uh, seeing our, our children coming to the world, those kind of things they are unable to feel. And they can pretend that they know and yeah. they can put that in words, but they don't know how to do that. I actually like that you brought this in, and I know that we have like a really strong uh, different um, views of how this could be, and it's really interesting to actually even um, discuss about the conceptualization of uh, knowledge and intelligence broadly. But what you brought in there, Nacho, made me think completely um, on a few experiences uh, that I have personally had. I because even given this understanding of that, they are let's call it pretending or making us believe that they conceptualize, right? Well, it's it's more on us, mm -hmm. not on, on, on the LLMs. The LLMs are clear on the limitations, is how we actually experience it. Um, I actually personally used even for, and I'm going to stray a little bit from product and go back just a second and bear with me. Um, actually, for creative processes, even more broad, I actually did an experiment in around my poetry writing, actually. And that is like, OK. I uh, did a piece, showed it up to it, said, review it, give me uh, your understanding. How do you interpret this? What are you seeing from what I'm writing? And give me a critique. And I received and I was like, hey, I hope it really got to understand a few things that I wasn't really expecting on even how nostalgia was um, or even growth depicted through images that had nothing to do. It was not really straightforward there. 
it made me understand incredibly opportunities that I hadn't even myself considered exploiting in that poem through different imagery. And I was like, hey, I didn't thought this image could convey this and that what was actually connected. What happened if I were to introduce this other one to really reinforce it and add it to the poem? So in that sense, it was really a process of enhancing creativity and the creative process, even though, I, of course, it's simply trying to understand language. And this goes me, yet yeah, takes me about completely to use cases around product. Um, and I think enhancing brainstorming and creativity is without a doubt one of the tools that it's incredibly useful for. If we understand limitations and we're mindful of very fine also the information, specifically if you're using it for accelerating research. Um, I think the latest versions that allow you to actually see the citation and the sources are a huge uh, advancement on that and have less like really understand from where it comes. And I'm really looking forward, as I mentioned, on seeing more how we can create more digital twins uh, for the discovery and design throughout this process and getting us a little bit into what happens when we work with synthetic data too. I'm like really excited on that. I know it's not like current use case I'm seeing now, but there's a few things that are moving that way and um, I would really like to see more of that. Um, I, I really love that the, that the use cases that you guys have brought are most of them related with this idea of chatting with the computer. And that's because you have this interaction background. Um, what, what I also like to bring here to the table, because I like the audience to also, to, to trigger the audience with some additional ideas. I think that this idea of chatting with a bot is amazing, but at the same time, we can use the bot as a, in the background, you know, to solve other tasks. And this is all possible through prompt engineering, which in the end is instructing the computer to do something. Uh, in a very structured manner so that they do exactly what we wanted to do. But um, it's I, I, I think that figuring out that by prompting and instructing the computer to do something, uh, we can unleash like different use cases. So for example, this summarization uh, use case that you brought, Calde, it's just a prompt saying, I provide you with this text and please extract a summary out of that. When we talk about, for example, uh, these these other use cases that you brought before about uh, analyzing massive amounts of data, then then we have a prompt that is essentially doing that, or we have a retrieval augmented generation system that uh, combines two different types of LLMs all together in the same structure. Also, the few shot learning algorithms that it's something that we have been doing research on. For, uh, for lots of years. And now we are experiencing that LLMs can be used for tasks like that. Kind of, I explained you how to do a task with only two or three examples, and then I have something that works as accurate as a classifier that otherwise I should train with thousands of samples. And maybe I, it's, it's not perfect, but can be used already, which is like the important part, right? Um, but I'm bringing all these technical details because one thing that I was thinking about that, that is kind of difficult in this scenario, in this landscape, is to, to run these discovery sessions, right? Trying to connect the dots between the use cases and the solutions that are available. Now it feels like everything is possible with AI. Uh, so, so finding that sweet spot in which the solution connects with the, with the problem or, or, the, or the user requirements, it's kind of uh, challenging, right? Yes. Um... And I have something to add here because um, what I think is that what um, it would be interesting if we focus more on how this technology can help and um, augment user abilities rather than automate them away, right? Because I'm seeing also like that trend, like this can be automated through AI and, and there is like a dream of, of that, right? But um, when AI is used to augment the experience that a human being has with his work, is uh, I find it like much more interesting, right? And there is like a human side that is interesting to keep in the loop, and that is like uh, something that we should aim to, right? As product creators, right? We we'll, we'll start to create more and more products that incorporate AI 
features. And the way we incorporate that features is um, our decision. So we should like, continue getting into the user journeys, understanding the tasks they have to do, try to augment that task and, and automate away what makes sense to automate, but also provide tools to help that users in those contexts to do their, their jobs better, right? And I think there is like something really interesting to get into, into there that also has to do with uh, what makes uh, humans productive which is, I think, the, some like, nice conversation here, or what makes human viable to produce uh, new things. Because there is also like a, a lot of authenticity and things that can, won't be covered by, by LLMs, because uh, as you say, right, they are stochastic part, they are repeating, and they have been also been instru instructed into like having um, like a different, sorry, I, I have my, my kids screaming a little bit here, I'm not sure if this is being here. And I think that um, this, um, this uh, way, this has to do with how humans are productive, right? And they produce things, right? And what is valuable about humans. And that is like a really interesting and existential conversation too. I love that you bring this in actually on there because I've been thinking a lot about um, the whole innovation process and the way we, as you mentioned, we build value throughout the process. And we're discussing a lot of how actually the source can augment our creativity, can actually provide uh, an acceleration on even our way to get into insights. And if you think about innovation streaming from finding and understanding and framing uh, problems, and it can't stem either for new, from new problems or new solutions, and then you try to actually either walk forward, find a solution, or work backwards, finding the problems that your solution actually is able to solve. There's huge amount of work around synthesizing knowledge. So that main role right now is mainly focused on people. We are actually, and we require a lot of experts. We work a lot actually throughout the discovery of having research that we do from our side, working around having interviews with experts, having a lot of conversations to gather all that information, to walk through the process, challenging assumptions, and leading the conversation or even the thought of a, of a group to uncover uh, the value and create new things. And there's possibility there that I see that it's, um, I think I was commenting with you guys and still not see it yet completely uh, solidified or not in the practice day to day. And sorry that I'm becoming such like a long shot. I'm going always to the future. I don't know this is my <laughs> time today. Please bear with me. It's Friday. Uh, I shouldn't be saying that day actually. But well, we're recording this on Friday, guys, in January. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting because I think this is opening like a really interesting wave of okay, we've w relied a lot on people with specific uh, soft and both soft and hard skills for being like these incredible synthesizers and be able to um, manage the conversation for people from different backgrounds. And now we have a tool that can help us actually with a little bit that translation. I agree with you, Colin, it's very difficult and I think we're far away yet of uh, having it doing the synthesization process and being able to lead the thought process like this without a doubt. But I think it enables us to reach a broader uh, or easy to, easier to access specific knowledge that has a great power for the process. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I will save a few things for a much broader discussion about the future because I know uh, we are running out of time there. Yes, we are. Uh, I was going to say that that we are running out of time, but uh, actually, 
there, there were so many things that you said that triggered other lines in my head, because at, on the one side, we can use them to, to help us during the, the process for ideation and, and for discovery. But sometimes we are trying to do a discovery for an AI application. So it's, it's kind of an inception movie, you know, we have an AI component inside an AI component. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but I think that we have already enough topics to, to start talking about in the next episode. So uh, I would encourage you guys, if you are listening to this, to get ready for the next episode, because we will cover some of the points that we missed in this one. We will talk a little bit more about this creation process and how AI can be embedded in these, in these processes. And we will also talk about our forecasts about the future of AI and the future of product when it comes to AI. Uh, but I would like to thank you, Galde and Biko. I think that uh, it was a really insightful conversation that we had today. Um, I really appreciate that we smile more than in the last episode. So that's good news. <laughs> we also had some interruptions as well, but it doesn't matter. I think that, that it's, it's a more relaxed episode. Um, completely and to the audience and, yeah yeah and, and and to the audience if 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 you guys made it to this point that means that you have listened to the entire episode which is always great so thank you for your company much appreciated uh, yes um we have like covered... subscribe share <laughs> yes <laughs> we have to make all that all the, all that promotion uh, so yeah, if you enjoyed the episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or comment in the box below if you're watching us on YouTube. And remember that Chain of Thoughts, these podcasts, seeks to build a community of product designers, developers, and AI experts to keep creating great digital tools for customers and users. So to keep this community growing, remember, as Galde said, like, follow, and subscribe to Chain of Thoughts in Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and share with your own followers using the hashtag Chain of Thoughts Podcast on X and LinkedIn. You can also follow Iron Coder on these social media platforms to keep yourself updated about the show and our actions as a company. And see you soon on the next piece of the chain. See you, see you soon. soon. Thank Bye. you, Nacho.